सकते हैं और देवता लोग जीवों के कामनाओं पर इच्छाओं को भले ही पूर्ण कर सकते हैं पर तो उनके हृदय को बदल कर भक्ति में लगाना ये जो अत्यंत दुर्लभ बड़ा ही कठिन काम है ये केवल साधु पुरुषों ने ही ये जिम्मेदारी उठाई है भागवत जी में कहा है जैसे भगवान अपनी दोनों भूजाओं के द्वारा धीर संत धर्म महाभारत रूपी और सिद्धांत सिद्धांत शून्यवाद को विदारित करके संपूर्ण विश्व में जिन्होंने अपना गीत कृष्ण प्रेम भक्ति का आरोहण सृष्टि कर दिया और विश्व जगत में कृष्ण प्रेम प्रफुल्लित किया ऐसे आज भक्ति वेदांत स्वामी महाराज जी के तिरुभक्ति पर उनके गुलाम लेखा हम लोग स्मरण करते हैं एक बार हम मैं जूहू ईस्टर्न मंदिर में गया तो वहाँ हमारे एक रघुनाथ ब्रह्मचारी तो उनके साथ में ये भक्त बड़े हंसी मजाक करने लगे बोले भाई हंसी मजाक हो रही है बड़ी बड़ी बातें कर रहे हैं क्या बातें तो उस समय उन्होंने कहा मैंने जब पूछा कि भाई क्या बात है बड़े मजेदार बातें करी तो बात क्या है समझाओ हमें उस समय उन्होंने बताया बोले भाई जिस व्यक्ति ने बात की वो एक स्मार्लर था स्मार्लिंग करता था क्या बोल जब स्वामी महाराज जी विदेश से लौट करके एयरपोर्ट में रूद रहे तो सभी भक्तों ने उनका स्वागत किया कीर्तन करते हुए उन्हें ले आए सभी लोग गाड़ी में आ रहे थे बहुत मरना भी उनके साथ और एक कार में बैठ कर ले आए स्वामी महाराज जी मंदिर में आते के प्रणाम किया परिक्रमा की और बैठ करके कुछ हरी कथा सुनाने लगे उनके कथा प्रवचन के बाद में ये नियम है कि सभी से पूछते आपका कि किसका क्या प्रश्न है पूछे और हम सबका उत्तर दे सभी लोग अपना अपना प्रश्न पूछने लगे उस समय वो समाजला जो पीछे बैठा हुआ था उसने कहा गुरु जी मेरा एक प्रश्न है बोले क्या प्रश्न बोले मैं एकांत में आपके साथ में कुछ बात करूंगा या सबके सामने नहीं बोलूंगा बोले अच्छी बात है तो उस समय गुरु जी ने कहा कि आओ मेरे कमरे में तब उसको कमरे में बुला लिया बुला कर उसने क्या की जब सभी भक्त लोग बाहर दरवाजे से बाहर खड़े हैं उस समय उसको बुला लिया तो अंदर में जाकर ही उन्होंने आठ से दरवाजे को धक्का मार दी तो अपने आप दरवाजा बंद हो गया अंदर से कोई अंदर आ ही नहीं सके कि वो स्वामी प्रभुपाल जी अकेले इतने में प्रभुपाल जी अपने कमरे में जा करके लॉक करके घूम करके उनसे कहा बोलो क्या पूछना चाहते हो बात बोलो इतने में उसने क्या किया अपने जेल में से पिस्तल निकाल ली पिस्तल निकाल करके स्वामी महाराज जी के छाती पर धर दिया बोले कि स्वामी जी एक लाख जवाब चाहिए बोले एक लाख जरा बोले अच्छा एक लाख जवाब किया जाएगा कोई बात नहीं पर सात दिन का टाइम दो अभी हमारे पास कलर कहा है सात दिन में हम व्यवस्था बना करके रख देंगे तो भेज दिया जाएगा पर एक शब्द है सात दिन तक मैं हरी कथा करूंगा मेरे प्रवचन में सामने आकर के बैठना पड़ेगा सुबह शाम जी हम दोनों टाइम हरी कथा सुनाएंगे तो मैं सात दिन बैठ करके सुनना पड़ेगा बोले कि ठीक है मैं आऊंगा प्रवचन सुनूंगा सामने बैठा लिए सात दिन प्रवचन सुना लिए प्रवचन सुना सुनाने के बाद में बोले चलो मेरे कमरे में ले जा करके कमरे में रूपे की थैली या बैठ की था एक की जो डॉलर की एक की उनके सामने खोल दिया बोले कि लो इसको उठा कर ले जाओ इसमें में उन्होंने कहा अब लेता ही नहीं अब लेते रहे गुरु जी बोले उठाते क्यों नहीं ले जाओ डरा ले जाओ तो उस समय गुरु जी के पैरों में गिर पड़े बोले कि बोले अब मेरा भूल संशोधन हुआ मेरी आंखें आपने खोल दी आप मेरे मुझे उद्धार करें पैर में गिर गिर पड़े हमने जीवन भर क्या अन्ना क्या गलती की क्या पाप कर्म किया आज मुझे बचा आप कृपा करें उस समय 
बोले कि क्या है ये बताओ कि गुरु जी आज मेरा उद्धार करे हमें मंत्र दीक्षा दे और हमें डरा नहीं चाहिए बोले जाओ सिर मुड़ा कर गया तो सिर मुड़ा करके वे स्नान करके जब भी आए कपड़े पहनकर तब गुरु जी ने उन्हें मंत्र दीक्षा दी तो उस समय तो उस समय गुरु जी ने उन्हें मंत्र दीक्षा दी और उस समय उसने भी अपने सारे परिवार वाले को बुला लिया सभी को मंत्र दीक्षा दिला करके खिला पिला करके सब को भेज दिया बोले भाई तुम लोग घर जाओ मैं आज गुरु जी के पास में रहूंगा तब से वे गुरु जी के पास में रहने लगे एक दिन स्वामी महाराज जी आनंद में ऐसे घूम रहे थे उस समय बड़ा मंदिर बना नहीं केवल छोटा मोटा कुछ कमरे ही बने थे तो चार बार खुला था उससे बहुत घूम रहे थे इधर उधर उस समय उस व्यक्ति ने जा करके गुरु जी से कहा गुरु जी आपने तो सबको सारी सेवाएं दी मुझे आपको सेवा दीजिए बोले अच्छा सेवा चाहिए गुरु जी ने कहा है यहाँ जितने कुत्ते घूम रहे हैं सारे कुत्तों को भरा यही तुम्हारी ड्यूटी है तुम्हारी सेवा तो वो व्यक्ति बोले कि गुरु जी ने मुझको खुद से भुलाने की सेवा की आज मेरा जीवन इसी तरह से परिवर्तन हुआ तो ये भक्त ने ऐसे तो बड़े अति मजाक की बात थी ऐसे ऐसे लोगों को जो बगेल गुंडे बदमाश नास्ती उतार के स्वर्ग को परिवर्तन कर दिया ऐसे ऐसे महापुरुष उनको जन्म दर्शन करने का मुझे सौभाग्य प्राप्त तो हुआ था सेवेंटी एट में महाराज के हिसाब में गुरु जी के हिसाब वृंदावन में उनके पास प्रतिदिन हम लोग ज्ञान करते थे ऐसे महाराज श्री जो कि अपार करुणा वर्षण करने वाले स्वामी प्रभुपा जी के चरणों में हम आज प्रणाम निवेदन करते हैं अभी वैष्णव वे उनके गुणावली का पालन करेंगे पंचा गुणोत्तर से कृपाल सिंह देव So this is Hare Krishna, this one. You should know that no one ever put a gun to my guru's chest because I would have killed him first. So this morning, and the late morning, we had a number of offerings being given by disciples of our Srila A.C. Bhakti Nanda Swami Maharaj, our Prabhupada. And this evening, uh, before the RT, which is at 7.30, we have some time for calling on a number of other uh, disciples. We have a list and I'm trying to give opportunity for all. So I'm requesting that the devotees who are speaking should try to keep it short so that everyone can have some opportunity to speak. This is the final chance this evening. So, um, to begin, I'm going to call on one of the disciples of Srila Prabhupada, senior devotee, who helped the preaching mission in the Latin American countries in the beginning of a Krishna consciousness movement there, and uh, who is presently helping Sri Gurudev's mission so much, along with his wife, Baba Tarini So I'm calling on Sri Hari Prabhu to come and glorify Sri Prabhupada.
Namaste Saraswati De Gauravani Prachari Nirvise Sasunavani Pasajanari Sarvam First of all, I want to offer my most humble obeisances for the body that I know is going on to my Guru Dev, my Dikshri Guru Dev and equally so to my Chief Sri Guru Dev on Vishnu Bhattama Hamsa Vibhajari Chari as it is at the season of the Tiburant and Arayana Mandas. I've never spoken in the assembly of such um, honorable and creative audience, I must admit. Um, there are so many things that we can uh, say about Sri Aguru Dev, Prabhupada, Sri Guru. Um, the beginning I was um, the first devotee there in Buenos Aires, Argentina. Um, I met the devotees actually in my uh, traveling in 1971 in Berkeley. And I think I bought a magazine. At that time I was sent to the youth movement. And um, of course a lot of me trying to find peace, love, and funny enough, the first magazine, my first VTG is Father Ram Killing Monster. It was very attractive. So every time I hitchhiked or went across the country, the devotees were there. But I never really, um, everybody was telling me, well, this movement, they're fanatics, they're, they're fascists, <laughs> they don't like women. And the one who case you in this society. So there I am, I'm coming from a family that, that funded churches in Argentina, we came from Spain. Uh, and one thing my mother taught me was that I always love God. <coughs> Don't worry about the society, because I've seen it all. So we know how um, hypocrisy creeps in. So I always had faith and always try to find love. I love God. But then again, I didn't know who God was. I always asked her, who is God? Where is God? What am I doing here? In my search, Port of Cyrus is a very cultural place, in a way. I mean, there's about 95% of the population is European. We have French, we have Italians, we have Spanish, German, Swiss. So there were uh, Vivekananda actually came to Buenos Aires in the turn of the century. So you can see that all that influence, including the learning about God in those days where either you remain in the Catholic Church, full of fear that if you leave you'd be in mortal sin, or you take the new philosophies that were actually describing an impersonal aspect of God. It was very dry. I just couldn't finish all the books. Those books on Raja, Raja Yoga where he says they were maybe about a hundred pages long. <laughs> that was all the books. So, um, in my search, I'm in Berkeley and continue my traveling. I keep meeting the bodies and one day I open the magazine and there is Sri Prabhupada. It's a black and white photo of one of his preaching engagements. And Sri Prabhupada is the photograph is his arms up. And um, I said, wow, I guess he likes to be worshipped. But let me give you a background. In Argentina I was a big dictator um, after having democratic country for many, for a long time, 1810 to... So in the 40s, when it was fashionable to have a, a dictator, Peron was one of them, was it. And he used to like to go on the balcony and go like... <laughs> you can imagine that, what we used to say, that was a great turn off. Uh, turn the magazine off. But I kept on being attracted to the Loki somehow. And I kept meeting them everywhere. I go from coast to coast in hiking and I met them in New York and again, sweet balls and a magazine. So, 
from the middle. They used to ask me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, archaeologist. They were like, oh, it is weird. But I had this inkling of coming to this ancient knowledge. I wanted to know. And when I heard about India, I had to be there. So at that time, I was 18 years old and convinced my father to let me take a break from college. He said, okay, I'll give you a ticket. You got to make the rest. So I went, I came to the United States. The body said, go on to England. All my purpose, my mind was to go come all the way to India. Later on, I realized that Sila Prabhupada saved me in many different ways. And he had many gifts for me. And so, later on, um, I was doing Sankitan, traveling Sankitan to the United States. We went to Europe, and from Europe, we crossed all Europe, all Central Asia, and we end up here in Vrindavan. All the way, including all the way up to Mayapur, where Sila Prabhupada was there. So, in my upbringing as a Christian, God was such a figure so far away. And it was all in all in reverence, so you can't imagine thinking of God having passed them because they wouldn't, wasn't there. And if you study any art book, and I finally went to the Sistine Chapel as the Lord, if you see the frescoes in the front, where the mass is held, there's God, it's an old man with white hair. Not very attractive. And it's always a thunderbolt. Right. That was one conception. So imagine living in a society like this and then meeting or finding um, this amazing personality clarifying and bringing out who God is. I seen posters of the world and I thought that was a beautiful youth. And then about a year later, when I met the devotees, I said, yeah, Sanyas is, this is Krishna. That's the way he looks. He's eternally youthful. So that makes sense. God, why not? We're looking for eternal life. We want to be young forever, we want to be beautiful, what kind of God be like that, that is supreme. You know, all those things were revealed to me in time by my dear Guru Dev Sri Prabhupada. So let's say I joined the movement in, in March, by November, I took first initiation. And Prabhupada said, yes, he can take Diksha in six months. But due to circumstance, I want to make a short. My brother-in-law, I mean, who became brother-in-law, was a senior disciple who had opened many temples. And actually, he had been in sannyas. So it was a big scandal. It was another way to see Sri Prabhupada. So with the three of us, my sister, who was 11 years older than me, uh, myself, and well, actually, uh, this devotee, Anna, Prabhu, and myself, went to see Sri Prabhupada. So I came into this room, of course I was very, very nervous. I'm clinching three books, and they were the first three books translated into Spanish, into Castilian, actually, that's another tongue. And uh, these books were really hard to understand by any standard of if you were from Argentina or if you were from Spain. I mean, I have, my sister knew every single printer in Buenos Aires with connections to Barcelona, connections to Italy. And they were saying, we try to read these books, but the, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not working. I mean, somebody has to edit them. So I did that. That was my first service. It was actually from day one, was to translate. Hanuman was French Canadian, and he was learning Spanish at that time. So he asked me to translate. That's how I learned Gita. And it was like everything that I have ever searched for was there in a bona fide way, in a way that I knew was coming from a representative of God who had no duplicity, no cheating in his agenda. So here I'm at Sri Guru's quarters in Los Angeles and he motioned 
me to come closer. So I just pitched myself a little bit and the room looked like it's stretching away and really it was in bad, far away. I felt that all the karma, whatever I learned that karma was right back over my head and, and it was black and that, that, that I really could see all this. So I was very um, timid. But Prabhupada kept asking me to come, motioning me to come closer and closer. I said, I don't know why. Then I realized some tension this book was nervous me. And then when I'm just about about here, see that the Prabhupada is here, he's motioning me. He could move an eyebrow and you know what he was saying. He says, Oh, the books. So I give him the books. Prabhupada opened his eyes, and I know many of you have seen that when he, he was happy, it was like giving candy to a child. Or it's such a crude description I can't really, can't really fathom. And so Prabhupada looked at the book and in perfect pronunciation, perfect accent, he pronounces the title that we'll see in Sarah Krishna. So I'm thinking, wow, Prabhupada speaks Castilian too? He speaks Spanish too? <laughs> so he looked at me and he says, he quoted a verse. And he says, Krishna speaks even the bird's language. So that was my record with Sri Lanka today, Prabhupada. I have for very few meetings, I had some morning walks, but I always was very shy, I was very afraid of it, but I didn't think that I needed to ask anything since he asked me to read his books and that was what I was doing, reading the books, going on sacred time, and I was very satisfied. But he always would read my mind. Next time, when I, a um, few years later, when I met him, um, my brother-in-law calls me and says, I'm in Los Angeles, and he says, oh, Ciudad Prabhupada is going to be in Mexico City, so let's go. Be your chance to uh, take Diksha. I've been two years since he actually asked me to take Diksha, but since I have moved to LA and I was a new devotee, I was ready for that. So it was okay, it was great. So then I got a chance to meet again, see the Prabhupada in person, and that's when he gave me Diksha. Again, I was very nervous, so he asked to guide my hand like a child to count to ten, and then he appeared. So I left and I went to Golden Diksha for Sri Prabhupada and I brought him a blanket. I went all the way to Guatemala from Mexico, it was a few about a thousand miles or less. Brought him an onyx box and brought him some honey. And the day Sri Prabhupada is leaving, the, his room is very busy. And Aniruda Prabhu told me a similar story, it was the same to a very shy and probably uh, read his mind and then tell him what to do. So I said, well, it's the last day. I have my last chance to really be with Prabhupada in his presence in this room and see if I can please him somehow. Well, I thought maybe it's friendly. If he tries honey, I, I heard him. He like that. So I'm sitting in the room against the wall. I'm trying to be like a fly. And then it's Nita, his translator, his secretary, or Sanyasi, everybody's buzzing around. How was directing everyone to do what they needed to do to get ready to go? And the pot of honey was sitting there in his desk, and I'm thinking, how am I going to. I wish I could please you over there. I wish, how am I going to please you? If you could taste the honey, perhaps it would be happy. And he looked at me one eye and says, honey, you cannot eat it right away. You have to wait one year. It's opposite. So as the years went by, I was wondering always, what was the best service to do? Was it Sankirtan? Was it Reef? What was Prabhupada's desire? And what was the desire? I didn't know. I tried everything. I went on Sankirtan, I collected money, I, I, by the time I got to India, I, read, I was always reading Shemad Bhagavatam. I believe it was the sixth time to my then coming out. It was Shiva Prabhupada stressed that actually Arjuna was good for us too, but Sankirtan was helping us to be a steer and give us a sense of enjoyment. 
and Arjuna was given as kind of spirituality and giving up also our false seal of, oh, now I'm serving Krishna, I gotta be on time. Everything has to be for his pleasure. So I remained in Vrindavan. Unfortunately, I couldn't remain there with only give us six months visas and that was it. So I'm going back to the West a year later, or less than a year later. Siddha Prabhupada enters his final Lina. And he actually phoned my brother in law, actually asked Rupanuga to call Hanuman and tell him to come. But he said, not only him, but I want all of my disciples to come. Everyone from the cook, everyone that should close the temple and come, come to my come to see. So I immediately I went to the temple president that that fell in death years and there was other resolutions passed and um, he left next morning and the rest of the temple will remain. So again, I was sure I could never come close with him. I didn't know how to please him. And actually, I didn't know really who I was dealing with. This great personality who, you could say this was a statement, he was a great diplomat, he was a erudite scholar, he was father figure, he was everything to us. So externally it was an amazing personality, but internally we didn't really invite him. But I always wanted to continue to somehow please him or understand his innermost desire. And finally, he always said, actually, everything is in my books. One day I got the service to, actually it was in Mexico, it was from morning time, I got a chance to go in the morning walk. All the way to the evening time, with Keso Rule says, come on, come on, I have a service for you, what? You can guard Guru Dev, you can be right there. Uh, at that time, my court was only one big building, was the other of Spain, Spain, and I believe it was the third floor. I remember it was the third floor. And I got there in the evening time. So I sat there at six to nine. It was very busy. The whole world was going by. Siddha Prabhupada remembered everybody. Remember their names, their services, where they were from. Families were going by. The, the world really was going by. But he could know and remember which one. By 9 o'clock, Siva Prabhupada turned off the light and went to rest. The same place he had been all day long. I'm sure he had done other things. He went to morning walk and came back. But then on his desk, he would sit. He received the world and translated. By 11 o'clock, the lights went on again. There was a mosquito net, and Siva Prabhupada sat up from lying down on his phone. Turned on his dictaphone and started to translate. All the way until they came back to look for me. Two hours he slept. Somebody told me, he said, uh, actually, my wife reminded me and said, yeah. They said the six go family slept only two hours a day. He said, I'm not so advanced, I sleep for you. But I don't think he did. <laughs> He probably said it was two hours. So years went by, and, and actually I had noticed that yes, he did put, he was preparing an enormous and amazing treasure trunk with all of its amazing things that later on were revealed to us. I read them too. I read Chaitanya Charitamrita. I read Prabhupada's books. The Gita I translated it. But never go close to really understand Guru Dev, Siddha Prabhupada. Until the time I met Siddha Prabhupada. He said he actually put a torchlight right on the books 
and he says, this is what we're, uh, this is what your guru wants you to have. This is the real treasure that you want to taste. Krishna Prem, Raja Prem, and even above that. So your guru today was more beautiful than me and knew a lot more than me. He was a great scholar. Said if you would have the time, your Chaitanya Charitamrita would have been kissed Chaitanya Charitamrita would be like this. He said, enormous. In 10 years, imagine what he did. He opened 108 temples, did more than 70 volumes of, of literature. I'm on Sankirtana and I'm meeting this executive, so maybe see him. They said, wow, he's an amazing person. I mean, we can't, we have problems trying to direct a few people, a few departments. He's in the world. He's managing this in 10 years. So yes, you know, we're everywhere. Amazing. We heard too that Sri Prabhupada went to Tirupati in South India here. All the Ramans wanted to get in the presidency of the temple and uh, do administration. Prabhupada said, okay, I'll do that. I switch to you. You direct this one, I'll direct the transition of the temple. So yes, how can I do this? Still, with my dull senses, I'm trying to reach. I try to touch its form. I try to, uh, and all I get is, it's actually, in reading Bhakti Pragyan Kishore Maharaj, he says, he puts himself actually in the lowest of positions. He even considers himself like Radha. He says, when I try to, when I massage my guru, when I try to touch him, he was a big being Radha. And he put this form, this lila, this, this, I thought it was this material form where I can massage and touch him and it just touches the illusory body. So I pray that you, O brothers, all of you from Gudiyamad, all of you who have known him, especially Bhune, that for me, I think he's the foremost disciple, the one that Prabhupada actually told us he was coming. In a very disguised way, Prabhupada told him that. One night at 10 30 at night, he called my brother in law, he was all worried because he's losing his GC to another Sanyas. And then, so Prabhupada calls him in the room at 10 30 at night. He said, Come on, let's go, Prabhupada is calling me. I said, Sir Prabhupada, I, I don't get along with my god brothers. Prabhupada laughs, says, I didn't get along with mine either. But then he got serious. He's, I, he commented with his, with his fingers. He said, I met, I met my Sula Guru only about ten times. But I followed him very well. I'm asking you to do the same. And Sula Prabhupada and then asked, Who's going to follow after you? Do you have someone in mind? Or he said, No. But I want you to go to the Vaishnava that your heart tells you to. Love and affection, love and affection. Everybody says that all the time. When my mother, as I told you, came from lines of new priests and churches and all that, and when she first, she met you at Prabhupada, and met the devotees, I said, wow, they all have love in their eyes. And then when I saw her again, and after Sila Prabhupada left, she says, you know, there's some change here. Everybody's got fear in their eyes. We're remaining out of fear. What did we understand? What did I understand? Again, when I heard these words from Guru Day, it's in love and affection. And I sat to his first lecture that I listened to. I said, yes. Okay, Sri Guru is here again. And Prabhupada again became alive. So I'm begging again at your feet, at the lotus feet of all the sannyasis of Prabhu's uh, Vaishnavas and Vaishnavas, please give me your grace so that I can one day uh, accomplish this, his desire, his innermost desire, his servant. And to help you to be a servant, I think it's going to be One of the senior most devotees in our assembly who came to the Krishna Consciousness Movement in New York and 
served Srila Prabhupada in India for many years while Prabhupada was present on the planet and also had so many wonderful exchanges, personal exchanges with Srila Prabhupada. Whenever we're talking about Prabhupada, he says, Oh yes, I remember one time Srila Prabhupada told me this on almost any subject. So we can hear tonight from Shriman uh, Bhagavatam Prabhu about his experiences with Srila Prabhupada.
What are you saying? No, no, no. This is not correct. And he looked at all of us and he said, You should know that Srila Prabhupada is a gopi. Then later he told me a little bit more and also he gave many lectures about the Summon Oya. Muni Maharaj knows these things also. So Srila Prabhupada, this is how we learn, this is how we understand. From Guru, Srila Prabhupada has spoken to Chaitanya Charitamrita, this is what I am. From Shastra it is given, this is what Srila Prabhupada is. And from the Sadhus, from Srila Gorgon Maharaj and from Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayan Maharaj, we have also heard what is the position of our Srila Prabhupada. So we understand by Guru, Shastra and Sadhu. This is what Srila Prabhupada taught us. Srila Prabhupada, as a Nitya Siddha, was living out Nara Bhattavila. But yet, he always was being reminded of what was his destiny. And he had the sense of destiny, of what he would become and what would he would accomplish for his spiritual master. There is a story by one Brahmachari, who was Srila Prabhupada's god brother, who lived at the Bombay Mount. During the 70s, this god brother used to come to Juhu and visit with the devotees. And we were there one time. And he said that during the opening of the Bombay Mud, I was in the room with Srila Bhakti Rachat Srila Maharaj and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. And Srila Maharaj suggested to Srila Saraswati Thakur that Abhai Babu, he has done so much to organize this mud in Bombay. So you should appoint him president. He should be the mud commander. He should be in charge of this mud. So Srila Saraswati Thakur told, no, 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 I have big plans for him. Not this president of temple, I have big, big plans for him. Then later, there was another discussion at that same time in Bombay that was told by Srila Kamamudusana Maharaj that they were sitting in the room. At that time, Madhusana Maharaj's name was Narakam Brahmachari. So he was sitting there, and Shri Sri Maharaj was there, Abhai Babu, Shri Prabhupada, and Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur, they were all sitting in the room. So Shri said they were talking about going to the West and preaching, bringing Krishna consciousness to the Western world. So at that time, Shri Saraswati Thakur said, they asked, who, who do you think should go? So he said, oh, Narutam, he can go. He speaks very good English. So Madhusudan Maharaj told that at that time he began weeping. That Guru Maharaj, please don't give me this order. Because I cannot live in separation from you. I cannot stay away from you. And if you give me this order, I will not be able to fulfill it. Then my whole spiritual life will be destroyed. So when Saraswati Thakur saw him, he said, no, no, it's all right. You don't have to take this order. He said, anyway, Abhai Babu is going to do it. He will do everything. So like this, there was a sense of destiny. There is one other story about this sense of destiny given by Nayana Baba. Nayana Baba Maharaj, he told the story that in 1936 on the last Vrindavan Parikram, which was Saraswati Thakur, that at that time, Goswami Maharaj had just come back from UK and they had a big pandal and a big assembly, all the sannyasis and brahmacharis, many of the staff from the devotees, sitting in front of Shri Saraswati Thakur and to the side was grihastas and ladies like that. So at that time, Shri Saraswati Thakur was addressing the assembly and he said, Shri Bhakti Vinod Thakur wanted us to go to the Western world and to preach the mission of Mahaprabhu. 
He said, my mother, Bhagavati Devi, made me vow on her deathbed that I would send devotees to the Western world to preach the mission of Mahaprabhu. So therefore, because of the request of these great devotees, I have spent the lifeblood of Gaudiya Mahaprabhu to preach in the Western world. He said, up to now, we have not had a very big success. So I was at just at that moment, Shilabhati Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur looked away from all the sannyasis and he looked far over to the side. And Nayana Baba said, he appeared to be looking at me, but then as I saw him, I could see he was actually looking past me. Then I turned, and right there was a Bible. And I was looking at the Bible's eyes, and he was looking directly at Shiva Saraswati Thakur, and they were looking at each other, and there was a long moment of silence. And then Shiva Saraswati Thakur turned, to all the sannyasins, he said, I am going to make a prediction that the next person who goes to preach in the Western world, no matter how long it shall take, he will return with the whole world from his preaching. So in this way, there was a sense of destiny. Again and again, Shiva Saraswati Thakur was saying, even on the day Shiva Prabhupada got initiated, they asked, what service shall we give him? In time, he will do everything. This was Shiva Saraswati Thakur's mood about Prabhupada. So in this way, they had a very intimate relationship. Very, very intimate. And Srila Prabhupada had very, very deep emotional feelings for his spiritual master and for the mission that was given to him from the very moment that they met. You are an educated young man, Srila Sarasati Gakorto. You will preach in the English language in the Western world and spread the mission of Mahaprabhu. So from the beginning, he took that message very seriously. Another feature of Srila Prabhupada, we have spoken much about his humility today. But when he got initiated, they asked, you have not given any name? He said, no, he's already named. Abai Chana, he who is fearless, fearless at the lotus feet of Krishna. One who knows that he is always with Krishna. I remember when Srila Gaurabhira Maharaj asked about taking sannyas, Srila Prabhupada told, you must know what it means to take sannyas, that one must be fearless. A person is fearless because he always knows that he is there with Krishna, that Krishna is present with him, and he has no fear. Srila Prabhupada exemplified that fearlessness. Otherwise, how is it possible that at 69 years of age, when most people are hobbling around in the holy places, retiring, and trying to find some little room to live out their days, that he boldly got on a steamship and traveled halfway around the world to preach the message of Mahaprabhu, so much deeply dedicated to his spiritual master, so fearless to come all alone, because he knew he was not alone. He was with Krishna. He knew that Krishna was with him. His in relationship was so intimate that in his prayers on the ship on the way over, he told, Oh, by, he calls Krishna his brother. If you want the mercy of Srimati Radharani, then you will have to help me. <laughs> So in this way, acting as the agent for Srimati Radharani, he's informing Krishna that if you want her mercy, if you want her love and affection, then you will have to help me to make this mission a success in spreading her glory.
So in this way, Phil Prabhupada was fearless. There was a fearlessness that no matter what he did, he could accomplish. When Srila Prabhupada was here in Vrindavan with us in the early days at Radhanamadar Temple, he told some of the devotees when he took us to the temple, he said, here at Radhanamadar is where I prepared myself for preaching in the Western world. So at that time, some of the devotees asked, so how should we prepare? Srila Prabhupada said, you don't have to prepare. I am empowering you. So we have come to understand how is it that such a personality empowers people because such a Mr. Siddha, Srila Prabhupada, he was always chanting Siddha Nam. Srila Gurudev, one day he explained that one who chants Siddha Nam, whenever he speaks, it must come true. So there is a story about Srila Prabhupada in the very early days when he first arrived in America. He used to walk along this long walk in the Riverside Park, along the, uh, the uh, West, uh, West River, I think it's called, Hudson River. So he used to walk up and down there, and there was one elderly man who we came to know just after Shula Prabhupada left. And this elderly man said sometimes he would come and sit on the bench next to me, and we would talk. And Shiva Prabhupada would choke with him a little bit. He said, uh, how old are you? And, I am this age. Where do you come from? And like that, Prabhupada would just make small talk with him a little bit. Once he even asked him, do you have all your teeth? The man said, no, I don't. I'm missing some of Prabhupada said, look, I have all my teeth. I'm 70. Like this, Prabhupada was joking. So then the man said to him, what are you doing here? You come from India, what are you doing? He said, oh, he said, I have hundreds of temples all over the world. And I have printed hundreds of books about Krishna consciousness in many languages all over the world. And I have thousands of followers that are distributing these books and teachings all over the world. And I have restaurants and this and that. And the man said, really? I, I never heard of this thing. Baba said, yes, it's all there. I'm only separated from it by time. The sense of destiny, the fearlessness that it was going to happen, and the pronunciation, it was there and then on that bench that Sri Prabhupada manifested the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. He spoke what his vision was, what his destiny was, and what he spoke manifested. This is the power of Siddhanam. Those who chant Siddhanam, what they speak comes true. This is their power. And so what he spoke that day on the bench manifested all over the world by the power of his chanting. Therefore he told the devotee, you don't have to prepare. Because I am empowering you. I am saying, print books and they manifest. I am saying, distribute books and it manifests. I am saying, open temples and it manifests. This was the power of Srila Prabhupada. This is the power of a Mahapurush, a Mahabhata, one who is chanting Siddhanta. Many of my God brothers who have try to understand Srila Prabhupada's teachings and often quoted that Srila Prabhupada says there is Vani and there is Babu and my Vani is more important than my God. There are many instructions in Srila Prabhupada's books and many of them I could not understand very easily. I had read the books for many, many years but a little bit under the guidance of Srila Gorbavinda Maharaj, I started to get some view of what was going on. But unfortunately, because of my apparatus, my devotional service was halted for some time. But again, under the guidance of Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayana Maharaj, 
I am now able to start mining the gems that have been buried deep within the purports of Srila Prabhupada's books. Srila Prabhupada Maharaj used to talk about Srila Prabhupada's purports. His commentary on the Bhagavatam and the Chaitanya Charitamrita as being a vast ocean of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu. And that deep within that ocean, just like in the material ocean, there is Ratnagarbha, gems in the belly of the ocean. So Srila Prabhupada Maharaj used to say that deep within this Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu of Srila Prabhupada's purports, there are many Bhakti Ratna, gems of Bhakti. And you cannot get those gems, you cannot find them so deep unless you have the guidance of a Mahaprabhu. Unless you have the guidance of a pure devotee. You cannot find them. He said, you will just skim across the surface of the ocean and you will catch only fish. So therefore, under the guidance of Shiva Bhakti Vedanta Narayan Maharaj, I have started to find out what it means when Srila Prabhupada said, the body is more important than the Babu. Under his guidance, I started to see what is Vani. Just like in the second canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam, second chapter, 36th verse, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada gives the indication what is the most important thing. He says there's nine processes of devotional service, and any one of them can help you to achieve perfection. But of all those nine processes, the most important is Shravan or hearing. He said, unless and until, Srila Prabhupada says this in the purport, unless one hears properly and sufficiently, properly from the mouth of the Mahabharata, sufficiently with the proper mood of greed, of loyalty, unless one hears properly and sufficiently, he cannot even execute any of the other processes of devotion. So yes, this is the Bani. If you are talking about Bani, then you should understand the Bani. You should understand in the first canto, first chapter, sixth verse, in the purport, hearing and explaining the revealed scriptures is more important than reading them. One can assimilate the revealed scriptures only by hearing and explaining. Shalom, Kirtan. Only by hearing and explaining. So, in this explanation, Srila Prabhupada <clears throat> uses a very unique word, assimilate. Now he could have said, you could learn the revealed scriptures, you could know, you could understand, you could realize, you could... So many words he could have used, but he used assimilate. The word assimilate is very significant because it means the transformation of food into living tissue. In other words, the transformation of this transcendental sound vibration will have an effect on the material condition of the living entity. What is that effect? Third canto, 25th chapter, 33rd verse. By the practice of bhakti yoga, one will digest digest the subtle body. Therefore, the ahamkar, the mana, the booty, the subtle body becomes digested, it becomes dissolved, and the transcendental body manifests. Again, Srila Prabhupada explains using the word assimilate, third canto, second chapter, fifth verse, that Vaidur was amazed by hearing the transcendental information from Uddhava and could understand that he had assimilated extensive love of God. So in the verse again, Prabhupada is using this word assimilate. And he makes the point in the purport that the word assimilation is indicative 
of the second stage in these three stages of love. He says there's three stages of devotional service. The first stage is the practice of the regular principles of devotional service. And the second stage is the assimilation and steady practice of devotional service, or bhava. And the third stage is the ecstatic prema of devotional service. So this assimilation of the revealed scriptures means that by digesting the subtle body and manifesting the true transcendental body, one assimilates the ecstasies of devotional service. This indicates the very deep realization of Srila Prabhupada's knowledge of the Sanskrit and English language and how he gave such powerful information in his books. But again, all of this happens by hearing. Srila Prabhupada states in the 53rd verse of the 7th chapter of the Antilila in the purport, one should not foolishly think that they can understand the process of devotional service simply by reading books. One must take shelter of a Vishuddha Vaishnava and under his guidance realize the purple. But these are the teachings of Srila Prabhupada. To my God brothers who say the Bani is more important than the Bapu, I ask them to please understand this Bani. You please read the Bani of Srila Prabhupada and understand his teaching. Understand what he is trying to say. Another important thing that we can learn from this concept of digesting the subtle body is that no one can have, if the first principle of bhakti yoga, which digests the subtle body, is hearing, shravana, then whom you're hearing from could not have a subtle body. A nitya siddha like Srila Prabhupada who comes into this universe will never accept the five forms of ignorance Moha, Maha, Moha, Tamishram, Andam, Tamishram, and Tama. He will never accept that. He will never accept the Hunkar. He will never accept the material mind or intelligence. Therefore, the spiritual body is directly inhabiting this physical body. Eternal, transcendental spiritual form is directly inhabiting this physical body. Srila Prabhupada explains this in the fourth canto, 22nd chapter, 26th verse in the purport where he says that just like the dry coconut remains with inside the husk of the coconut but is loose and independent from the actual coconut he said similarly the pure devotee lives within the body in the same way and because of his transcendental presence within the body then this material body becomes Chinmaya Sarir, a spiritualized body. So in this way, Srila Prabhupada explains what his actual position is, what the actual position of such a Nityasana is, that they are completely spiritualized. These things have been discussed by Srila Gurudev these past few days. These instructions are there in Srila Prabhupada's books. <coughs> Srila Prabhupada in one lecture one time told us that the inhabitants of Vrindavan are madly in love with Krishna. They have no other desire but to love Krishna. He said, they don't care that Krishna is God. He may be God or he may be whatever he is. They only know one thing, we love Krishna. This is Braj praying, Braj Rasi praying. They love Krishna because he's Krishna. Not because he's God, not because he's anyone or anything, but just because they love Krishna. Srila Prabhupada told in one lecture about Srimati Radharani that Srimati Radharani, she is a very the dear devotee. And if you want to really satisfy Krishna, he said, first you should satisfy Radharani. 
If you want to offer something to Krishna, first you should offer it to Radharani. You offer to Radharani and say, My dear Radharani, you please give this to your beloved Krishna. And then, he said, Sri Mati Radharani will say, Here, here is something from a very great devotee. He's even greater than I. He said, This is the mood of Sri Mati Radharani. So like this, he gave us an ind all these indications. One sitting in the room in Calcutta, one devotee asked him, Who is better? Who is greater? Mahaprabhu or Sri Mati Radharani? And he told he saw him and he looked at us, seeing if we could digest this <laughs> information. Then he said, Sri Mati Radharani. Then he pointed to the picture. He said, look, here you see, Radha has become very angry with Krishna. She is angry with Krishna because he has cheated on her. And now he has come and he is kneeling at her feet. He has placed his crown and his flute and his necklaces and his head at the feet of Srimati Radharani. He said, therefore Radharani is the greatest. So Srila Prabhupada gave us these indications. He taught us these things. He taught us the complete Siddhanta. And every disciple of Srila Prabhupada should know that what Srila Prabhupada taught us is also the same exact message is being taught by Srila Bhaktivedanta Narayana. And all the disciples of Srila Narayana should know that whatever Srila Narayana is teaching us was also being taught there in the books of Srila Prabhupada. We should understand these things very clearly. Now I've spent some time talking about these things and I know a lot of devotees remember that I was with Shiva Prabhupada in the last days when he was leaving this world in the times when Shiva Narayan Maharaj was coming to visit him. And I remember the first time I met Shiva Narayan Maharaj at, at the feet of Shiva Prabhupada. And at that time, he came into the room our Shiva Prabhupada was lying on the bed And he was very, very weak. His skin was completely translucent. His bones were showing on every part of his body. His weakness and his frailty was very, very obvious to everyone. And lying on the bed that night, that day, actually it was early in the day, Shilpa was deep in Samadhi. He was deep in his meditation. And Shri Narayan Maharaj came into the room and this was the first time we met. He turned to me. At that time I had a big fear because I was doing chapter Mas. I was one of only two devotees at that time that was doing chapter Mas. I was eating only one meal a day like that, doing brunch. So he asked, what is your name? First he asked my name, I told Bhagavata. And what is this? Why are you having that I told them doing chakmas all? So then he said to me, he took my arm. Come, come. I want to show you. And he took me next to the bed. Then he called two other devotees. You come. And show you something. He said, you see? You see your room Mara? His hands above his head like this. His head is tilted back like this. His back is swaying like this. His feet, his toes pointing down. Now, your Swami Maharaj is dancing with that condition. That time, that moment, he became my Shiksha Guru, but I didn't know. I didn't know at that moment he became my Shiksha Guru. I did not formalize that relationship for some years. Then at that time, 
he had some young brahmacharis with him, I don't know. Maybe that time Kirtan Maharaj was there, I don't know, or Madhav Maharaj and others, they were there. And he began to sing with the... Uh, then he sang with the Banjari Bhadal, that was another devotee. And when he sang, Sriyukta Manjari Bhadal, transcendental sound from his voice was so powerful. And later that day, after some hours, when Sri Prabhupada came out of his internal consciousness, when he came to external consciousness, later that day he told, they asked him, Sri Prabhupada, what have what, 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 what do you plan to do? How are you going to, to, to live? Because you are drinking only this much water and you are passing this much urine. So you will dehydrate, you will die. Shri Prabhupada said, yes, I'm thinking like that. So then we began weeping that Prabhupada, please, don't tell us these things. We don't want to hear this. Then he called one of the devotees in and he said to them, I have been talking with Krishna. So earlier that day, Chilaraya Maharaj told, he is dancing with Radha and Krishna. And now he told, I have been talking with Krishna, confirming what Chilaraya Maharaj has said. So they are very intimately connected. Then, Shri Narayan Maharaj, he had many deep discussions with Shri Prabhupada during that time. At that time, Shri Prabhupada directly instructed him that I have traveled the whole world now, I have done much to establish this society. He said, now we should preach together. He used these words. Now we should preach together. This is the order of Shri Prabhupada. So all of us should know that Sri Prabhupada's order is that we should preach together with Sri Narayana. This should be understood. Then, when he told Sri Narayana Maharaj that can you do certain things for me, Sri Narayana Maharaj told him, I accept you as my guru. Whatever you order me, I will do. So Sri Prabhupada, he asked him that you bring my god brothers here, I want to apologize to them, I have made some cutting remarks. And Sri Narayan Maharaj told him, no, 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 in, in such a worldwide mission what you have done, this is nothing, he said. Then when one of Sri Prabhupada's god brothers came, I think his name was Hindu At that time he came to see Sri Prabhupada, and Sri Prabhupada was begging him, you please forgive me, you please forgive me. Then Sri Narayan Maharaj told, please, why you are speaking like this? You have not committed any offense. And, Sri Narayan Maharaj told, anyone who thinks you have committed an offense, they themselves are an offender. This Sri Narayan Maharaj told, like this. So close, intimate relationship. Then that time, Sri Narayan Maharaj told, that yes, you have built this worldwide mission. It is a very great thing. I will try to get the other devotees of Bodhi not to work with your devotees. But all of them should be a little humble. Not only with each other, but also with the other devotees of Bodhi Mat, they should be humble. This is a great mission which you have built, and we should try to protect it, and we should preserve it. And Sri Prabhupada then ordered him, yes, you kindly instruct them, all of us, on this matter. I cannot speak. So this was the order again of Srila Prabhupada, that we should be instructed on how to protect and preserve the mission. And the mission is not just buildings. The mission is not just 
restaurants and buildings and, and money. No, the real mission is the sacred teachings of the Sampradaya. The real mission is the transcendental sound vibration from the lotus lips of the pure devotee. This is the mission. The mission of delivering Rasik Brother Prem Bhakti to the world. This is the mission to preserve and protect. This is what Shri Lakarai Maharaj was entrusted with. This is what Shri Lakarai wanted from him, and this is what he's trying to do. He promised, wherever you want me to, wherever they ask me to go, whatever they want from me, I will do my best. I consider you my future guru. I will do it. Now on the last day, when Shri Prabhupada was lying in the bed, I was reading for many, many months this Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu with all the details of ecstatic emotions. And on the last day when Shri Prabhupada was leaving this world, he started to exhibit these ecstatic emotions. I saw what he told in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, I saw. I saw him trembling, his whole body shaking and trembling, then rolling back and forth on the bed, this way and that way. Tears, so many tears coming from his eyes, hair standing on him. He arched his back, he began to roar very loud, and then to belching very loudly. In this way, one of uh, one ecstatic symptom after another he displayed over and over again. There were so many of us in the room. We were all chanting, we were all singing, we were all do, touching him, massaging him, doing so many things, but he was completely oblivious to everyone. Completely oblivious until Shri I Maharaj came in the room. That time he came in the room, I was at the head, massaging Shri Prabhupada's head. He came around behind me and he kneeled right here next to Shri Prabhupada's head while I was massaging the head and he leaned over and he whispered a mantra into the ear of Shri Prabhupada. And as soon as he whispered that mantra into the ear of Shri Prabhupada, Shri Prabhupada stopped. He came to external consciousness. Just like when Sri Damodar would chant a certain mantras in the ear of Mahaprabhu and bring him from internal consciousness to external consciousness. Just like that, Sri Narayan Maharaj was able, by the power of his Bhakti Shakti, to bring Sri Prabhupada to that external consciousness. And when he came to consciousness, he did not speak, he did not do, he did one thing only. He lifted his hand and he placed it over the head of Shri Narayan Maharaj. His last externally conscious act was to give Shri Narayan Maharaj his breath. I was a personal witness. I was only 12 inches away, one foot. I witnessed this with my own eyes. So I saw the intimate, deep relationship that they had. And Shri Prabhupada entrusted him with this very important mission of placing him in the Samadhi. And according to Hindu law, there's two laws in India, according to Hindu law, actually, Shri Narayan Maharaj is considered the rightful heir, the rightful Acharya to follow Shri Prabhupada. In fact, if he wanted to, he could even make a court case using that Hindu law. But he would never do such a thing. Why? Because he promised Shri Prabhupada, I will preserve and protect your mission. Therefore, instead what he did, he spent his own money out of his own pocket to go repeatedly to Bombay to help Iskand win a court case. It was a court case by Madan Mohan Dei, Prabhupada's son. And in that court case, he said that Shri Prabhupada is not a Brahmin. Therefore, he cannot take sannyas. Therefore, he's only a businessman. And Islam is a business enterprise, and it belongs to the blood relatives. In this way, he tried to steal his time. And Shilin Ramayi Maharaj, coming repeatedly to Bombay, gave evidence again and again. My Guru Maharaj was authorized by Shilin Bhakti Sarandha Sarandha Thakur to give sannyas. 
I was the one who performed the fire guilty. I was authorized to do the judgment. These things are authorized. The Vaishnava is as good as a Brahmin and more than a Brahmin. Like this, he quoted so many scriptures giving me evidence. By his evidence, this court case was won. By his evidence, this court case was won. And by his evidence, the mission was preserved and protected. This is the nature of a real pure devotee. This is the nature of a Shiksha Guru who made such a commitment to his Shiksha Guru that I will do whatever you ask me, whatever it takes. So we should understand very clearly what the mission of Srila Prabhupada was and how the mission of Srila Prabhupada is being carried on. Today is the disappearance day of my Guru Maharaj. He is there in Vrindavan, in his Samadhi. But I am here because the living transcendental sound vibration of my Guru Maharaj is being uttered in this place. That's why I am here. The transcendental representative of my Guru Maharaj's body is here. And that's why I am here. Shri Bhakti Raksha Shri Maharaj used to say, you should look to see where the current of Bhakti is flowing and then go to that current and get connected. The current of Bhakti is flowing here from the mouth of Shiva Bhakti Udhamdhananda. So I want to thank everyone for being a little patient with me. I spoke many a little bit long. But I had some things that I wanted to say to everyone. And I want to thank everyone for their association and their sound I want to thank everyone for coming here and celebrating the feast, the disappearance day of my Guru Maharaj, who was very, very dear to me. And although I am not fit to be his disciple, I am not qualified, and simply pray for the blessings of all the Vaishnavas, that somehow or other I may become a qualified servant of my Diksha Guru and my Diksha Guru who all thank you bless me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very wonderful to hear all of these recollections of our beloved Sri Prabhupada and the divine connection between our Shri Guru Day and Shri Prabhupada. So now I'd like to call up another very senior devotee in our assembly, a very uh, intimate god brother and friend who I met in the very early days, 1970, 71, uh, who served Shri Prabhupada very, very vigorously in his preaching mission throughout the 70s and into the 80s, and now serving Shri Guru Dev with the same kind of energy and expanding his mission in South India and calling him a god brother, Dr. Shripad, Prakiriyanta Bhai Thomas Maharaj.